Hi, everybody. I am Anna DeVere Smith, and welcome to uh, the third and final um, special series that I've been doing and hosting called Twilight 2020 as a part of the SIG Space Summit at Signature Theater. Um, for each of the uh, sessions that I've done, I've invited um, people who have connections to my play, Twilight Los Angeles. And, um, you know, Twilight Los Angeles was about events that happened uh, almost 30 years ago. And I'm asking guests to talk about the current unrest, protests around the murders of George Floyd and others. Do these current times echo the events that followed the beating of Rodney King? and the riots that were in that aftermath. You know, the world saw, and it was one of the first times George Holliday's video of Rodney King being beaten in Los Angeles was one of the first times that the common walking citizen had any idea of something called use of force that policemen do. And so this video, the beating was shown all over the world. Most people were horrified. And so when an all white jury came back with a not guilty verdict, the riots followed. To write Twilight, I went to Los Angeles in the aftermath of the riot and interviewed over 320 people. Those interviews were the basis of the play. I learned a lot then to say the least. And the question is, where are we now? I'm thrilled to be talking to two guests today. The first is Susan K. Lee. Susan has more than 25 years of experience in leading public safety and community engagement initiatives around the country, around across the United States. <clears throat> Until recently, she was the deputy mayor of public safety for the city of Chicago. And she's now staying on as senior advisor to Mayor Lightfoot while she becomes the chief of strategy and policy at Chicago CRED a social impact organization founded by former U.S. Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, and the dynamic philanthropist, Laureen Powell Jobs. The sole purpose of Chicago CRED is to achieve a transformative reduction in Chicago gun violence. She also has a long history with Los Angeles where she led the Urban Peace Institute and was co-author of a 2007 report that became the blueprint for Los Angeles to adopt a new approach to violence. Our other guest is Dr. Doreen Kondo. Doreen is a professor of American studies and anthropology and former director of Asian American studies at the University of, South, of Southern California, almost said South Carolina, the University of Southern California. I think that's making Doreen laugh. She was a dramaturg on the original production of Twilight and has over 20 years of experience as a dramaturg and a playwright. She's also an author and her latest book, World Making, Race, Performance, and the Work of Creativity theorizes race and power in the theater industry, spotlighting the work of David Henry Wong and also my work. Some of you have heard me talk about Doreen. I just haven't used her name. Um, if you've ever asked me how I whittled down you know, 320 interviews to a two hour play or whatever the case is. I always say that I have a very dynamic rehearsal hall with very smart people who are more progressive than me and who don't agree with each other. And that I watch them argue and then I go home and I write a new play for the next day. And Doreen is one of those people. Uh, so you're getting to see in person the very important person in my work. And I'm not alone. As you know, uh, when the theater shut down in March, uh, this new production of, of Twilight Los Angeles was only two weeks, weeks away from starting rehearsal at Signature. And um, this production was gonna have five incredible actors playing the 30 plus roles in the play. Well, they're all here today with me. It's so great not to be alone. It's Esther Che, Wesley T. Jones, Carl Kanzler, and Tiffany Rachel Stewart. They will ask questions after the first part of this. So welcome to everybody and especially welcome to Susan and Doreen. Welcome. Um, you know, uh, one of the opportunities that I had in researching and writing Twilight was to disorient 
my own lifelong understanding of race, having grown up on the East Coast in a de facto segregated town, Baltimore, and having gone to college with the uh, rise of the Black Panther Party, and also, you know, throughout my life, the civil rights movement. And in that way, thinking about race as a black and white phenomenon. And to come to Los Angeles after that riot was an explosion for me in terms of the presence in particular of the Latinx community, which was very diverse in and of itself. And of course, the Korean American community. And I'd like to start with the two of you just talking about the kind of limited view that we have on the main stage of our conversations about race in America and how much more complicated you understand the race story to be. Whoever wants to start can start. Well, I guess I'm happy to, to jump in just because I spent many years on the East Coast. I got my PhD at Harvard and taught there for a number of years. I'm from the West Coast, from Oregon, but from a largely uh, embattled, shall we say, Japanese American community in a rural area. Um, there is an indigenous population, um, but definitely the feeling of being a minoritarian subject and going to the East Coast where frankly, okay, so I think that there, the black white binary provides a kind of conceptual frame within which people see themselves inscribed in public discourse. So you, ha rather than thinking of racial representation like a second order, I wanna claim the realm of public discourse of theater, the arts, you know, um, popular culture as a zone of existence. And there's a way in which like beyond black and white, like people didn't really exist in their full complexity. And those were back in the days when there was like much really in terms of say popular culture, like nothing or anything existed. One was, you know, only represented in the most denigrating term. So I moved to LA, um, after having been on the East Coast for, and you know, I mean, I could live there happily. It's not that one couldn't, but it was just astonishing to me to be in a place, it was the only place I've ever felt at home. And I should say that the Asian American Studies Association, the scholarly um, association has a caucus called East of California. So different is <laughs> to many Asian Americans like the rest of the US right, from what the kinds of demographics that one can find in California. And there's the fact that it's called Los Angeles, right, and it's facing a different direction. It's not Europe, European facing, um, it makes it different from the start and the largest Iranian population outside Iran, the largest Korean population outside Korea, the largest Vietnam, you know, all of that. So for me, it was extraordinary and represented so much possibility. Um, the 92 uprisings for me was a moment when those possibilities felt fl literally a flame. And it was like, I love LA the way you love a person, tenderness and passion and a large, you know, it's like tolerance for faults. <laughs> you know what I mean? Racism is everywhere, you know, so on and so forth, um, economic disparity, but it was like, you know, holding the broken body of someone you love in a way, that's the way it felt. It was so, it was devastating. So to be invited to, you know, participate in um, Anna's important work was, you know, incredibly exciting, but it also felt like an enormous respons responsibility and so much like a lifetime of exclusion and pain and so on and so forth brought to bear on this. It's like someone was going to listen, we could trust, right? To bring it, but that kind of passion, I felt like my life depended on it. I can just say that. So it was- okay, I wanna come back to that, but I wanna quickly say before I ask Susan to respond, you know, this idea of Los Angeles and mm -hmm. it, our friend, well, we both That's know him, Baba, you know, he, he well, yes. mentions that, you know, and we call it LA. Right. You know, right there, right, 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 right. right. We, get, we take away, right. right. Um, right. So Susan, how, how do you think about that? 
And also, I mean, now with you being in this hotbed of a urban yes. area in Chicago. <laughs> Where race politics is quite uh, different than in LA for sure. Um, so, you know, I was a grad student when the 92 civil unrest happened. And prior to that, I was very much into being Korean um, and actually worked on Korean political prisoner issues for a long time. And then really the events around the beating of Rodney King, the trial, the, um, the civil unrest and the uprising sort of really woke me up to a different kind of racial um, identity configuration, recognition of structural racism as everyday reality um, in America. And you know, as much as it was about those white officers beating a black man, um, the, the events of 92 came to be known as a black Korean conflict, um, which to me was very much a, a simplification of all of the realities that we were seeing represented in the events of 92. And, and so that sparked me to really become a social justice, racial equity advocate for the next 30 years and continue to work in the community, primarily in the Latinx community, um, in the immigrant community um, and came to see violence and lack of safety as a critical threshold issue, whether it was police brutality or community violence in the communities. And that became kind of my work pathway. Um, and that took me to places throughout LA and you mentioned my work in LA, but also to places like Oakland, um, done in work in Memphis and Sacramento and Bakersfield. And so all the places where race and violence and um, police brutality merge. And, and so all of the work around police reform, accountability, uh, violence reduction from a public health perspective, all of that came to be um, part of my uh, work. And then I came to Chicago. Um, and I think, you know, you can imagine during a year like 2020, uh, none other like this year really, and the convergence of three crises around COVID, the pandemic, um, the murder of George Floyd, and the great um, recognition of the need for uh, police reform and accountability. And then obviously the spike in violence that many urban centers were seeing. Um, and, and being in government faced with those crises and having to triage every day the hundreds of protests that were going on while also being mindful of the need for police reform and managing COVID, um, I think is something that I just did not anticipate ever happening and challenging me in ways around race um, in, in two very important ways. One really is um, that COVID accentuates the ways in which racism and racial systems have oppressed folks because it's not by um, accident that more black and brown people have contracted and died from the disease. And it's also not by accident that more black and brown people die from gun violence or are treated brutally by the police. And so these are convergences of systems inequity in our lives. The other thing I will say, though, being in that position of the mayor's representative on public safety, my own Asian Americanness um, come, comes to fore because every time I walk into a room, I am challenged by folks saying, what does a short Asian woman know about public safety in Chicago or anywhere, really? Um, what, is, what could she possibly know of the plight of the black and brown, mostly men, but communities overall? And so the delegitimizing um, fact that happens um, it is part of this experience that we're going through and it feels not good. Um, um, it feels yeah. like we are not confronting the way things could, an imagining of a different way of looking at this, but that, that has been my reality for the last at least year and a half, but probably longer. You know, um, um, when you said the, 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 that the uh, events in Los Angeles, that's what the politicians call it, the uprising, the riot, the unrest, um, you said that it became known as a Black Korean conflict. It reminds me of uh, my play about another riot uh, about Blacks and Jews in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, and a very smart Jewish woman who assessed, and I thought it was very interesting. She said, you know, Blacks and Jews are always sort of playing out in a metaphoric way. 
the drama of race. They're the, oh. They are. I see. They are the characters. Hmm. And the rest of the country watches. And when you say that about the Black Korean conflict, because of course the whole thing was so much, it was complex. And we think about the people who were deported. Um, hmm. But 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 say a little bit about the Black Korean conflict and 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 during pop right into whenever you yeah. want. Yeah. Well, just go ahead. Go ahead. Just one quick thing, because one interesting thing about that is that it's not a coeval, it's not an equivalent category, right? So that Korean, it becomes a synecdoche for Asian American to some extent. So I recall in Twilight trying to say, well, there are Cambodians in Long Beach, their businesses were also burned, or how can, that was when Twilight was like three hours long and you were on book, I think we had, right. you first, know. Three weeks with four hours. Oh, four hours, right. Yeah. So yeah, very long. So we're trying to like encompass all these perspectives, but you know, Cambodians who had, you know, or Vietnamese who had fled or, you know, those of us, I'm Sansei, like third generation American, right? So how do we, so for me, it's like seeing cultural possibility of flame. Of course, Korean American communities were incredibly hard hit, the most hard hit amongst Asian Americans, so that makes sense. But it's very interesting, and that did not happen actually in the current, in the George Floyd killings, right? That was, became a very sort of multiracial um, issue, at least in terms of the people protesting and so on and so forth. So it was quite different. I mean, Latasha Harlan's happened, you know, um, just right after our, the Rodney King beating, you know, all of that. So it became um, encapsulated in that kind of duality. And there were so many TV programs and so on that kept recirculating this binary. On the one hand, I suppose, I don't know, Susan, how you feel, but it, you know, it does draw attention to, the, to a, a population that was you know, disproportionately suffering. On the other hand, like, how do you feel about that vis-a-vis -vis Asian Americans as a whole? And how, how are we trying to it, you know, at least pay some attention to that within Twilight, but maybe after a certain point, it became unwieldy. So, I mean, the Black Korean construct, I think, was um, a code word, really, for some of class dynamics um, and certainly colonial history of Korea by US, um, which I think inculcated Korean immigrants with sense of a racial caste system that they saw in the military occupation that has happened for a long time. And so it, it speaks to history of America in the world, but also the way in which different waves of immigrants have interacted with the African-American community and increasingly now the Latinx community. And so I took pride in the most recent protests, the righteous protests that were going on, that it was very multi-generational and multiracial. Um, but as the deputy mayor, I also saw lots of folks um, showing up to provoke and to incite violence. Um, we had folks show up with frozen bottles of water and frozen bottles of urine and um, acid and you know um, things to throw at the cops to try to injure and provoke. And not everyone was being peaceful. And so in the throes of calling for justice, you know, what do you do as somebody who is in a position of governing with that spectacle that is going on? Um, and the other thing that really was disheartening that I would say is that in Chicago, we did have targeting of Asian businesses by African-American um, protesters that at times got violent. Um, and so while, um, you know, some of, you know, we have, advance because all the multiracial, multi-generational, I think showing up in protest of the murder of George Floyd tells us that we are mm -hmm. um, going bending towards the arc of justice. Yeah, yeah. But some of the other kinds of um, dynamics that we saw in 92 continues yeah. um, and we're not quite out of woods yet. And we have a president, you know, in this tapestry, in this pageant, that we're in right now, who keeps calling uh, the pandemic the China virus, mm -hmm. and so you know there's a concern and and Asian hate crimes. I mean, in, in this moment, in this big big pageant. Mm -hmm. Sorry. 
which is not helpful. You know, I want to make sure, Doreen, that you say some things about theater in this moment, because of course, uh, your scholarship is very aware of uh, race in theater. And, and I, what do you think about this moment when the theater itself, the stage is a, a place of upheaval, where the institutions are? Well, A, that it's in question or in upheaval is a good thing. I hope it's in upheaval enough um, because I think that often what happens is, you know, you see the theater website and Black Lives Matter, but really how deeply does that affirmation go? So that again and again, we've seen, you know, playwrights of color say, you know, repeat the different way levels at which they are excluded from different kinds of spaces. I think that is continuing. So this is why I think Edda, your work is so important because it addresses these difficult issues of race, class, power. You hired a very multiracial creative team and crew. There were characters that we have never seen before on the US stage and the pro in the process, you welcome people who had well-developed senses of identity and strong opinions into the rehearsal room was not always pretty. And I've always regretted, you know, I wish I had heard of Liz Lerman before then, <laughs> but, you know, to try to take care of feelings, but it was like that feeling that my life depended on, you know, something to-, to, to say, you know. say something about that, because number one, I, we talk, Hector and I talk about that, that, uh, that rehearsal, that that room where the dressing room we all convened after I busted my ass on stage and y'all got on me, man. <laughs> and, uh, I talked to uh, Oscar about it earlier this fall, this spring. And so, I mean, I think, you know, if we want to have, what what did you learn about what it costs to, not just money, uh, Gordon put a big paycheck down, big, big, big. Nobody's done it that big for me. So, well, no, house arrest, yes. but. What did you learn about the about being in that explosive room in terms of what it means to bring more in, basically? I think it takes a willingness to confront the possibility that your most fundamental assumptions could be destabilized, that it won't necessarily feel good. Ideally, one would try to take care of it. I mean, I regret that I was so undiplomatic. No, I always congratulate you for that. I always congratulate you. I always congratulate you for you and Hector both, like really coming down and saying, you know what? We have to represent our communities, right? And, and, and I was so upset, you know, sort of crying and I thought, Doreen's my friend and I got home to my apartment because still had fax machines and I heard this long fax going and I thought Doreen's going to apologize and I picked up the fax and it basically said and furthermore. No, I know. <laughs> but you know, I'll cry. I always say it on Twilight, I've never cried so much or been so happy. So after that night I went, it was like I was like ready to cry and I brushed past Oscar and didn't say anything because I was afraid I would start crying. I didn't want to cry in front of a big white guy. So I just ran, <laughs> ran away. And he said I was rude. <laughs> but, you had your reason. But I think that it takes that kind of, you know, it's in fact, it's because we believed in you, believed in the project, and you listened, honestly. So it takes someone who can hear that, process it, and listen. And of course, you don't have to take all our notes, but ultimately, it's meant to bring to you the concerns of the individual dramaturg, but ideally of the community, right? So it's just, it's, you know, it's meant not in a destructive way, even though I'm sure it must have felt that way. Yeah, it's, it's my lifeblood, Doreen. And it's, it's Stephen Wadsworth just uh, sent me- Oh, over, Stephen! You know, from our days with Let Me Down. <laughs> yes. um, you know, I wanna make sure I get to talk to you, Susan, about violence. I mean, you know, here you are back there with Connie Rice, not Condoleezza Rice, but Connie Rice. I mean, you're, 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 you're looking at, at ways to get at peace in, in the Los Angeles community. Now you are, you know, you're not taking guns out of people's hands, but you know, you sure would maybe like to, you know. I mean, talk to me about what you understand about violence. Of course, Twilight Los Angeles is a play, is 
full of violence. Yeah. Well, Connie, uh, one of my other mentors, along with Elaine, um, used to say that there is no freedom without freedom from violence and no rights unless you have right to safety. Um, and I think that's the premise with which I approach the work and is to say that every person, particularly every child, um, deserves that right to safety and freedom from violence. And why is it that we can't seem to provide that? Um, and, and the reason is structural racism is because um, communities have been for generations um, sort of occupied by hostile police um, and have the violence been generated as a result of disinvestment, lack of opportunities, where the um, subculture and unofficial economy is the only way to come up to have any resources. And so that has created these cycles of violence. And while you have decimated any kind of public health support systems to deal with the trauma, deal with um, education, deal with social services and health needs. And so, you know, the only way out of the violence, which is really a symptom of lots of other inequities that we are seeing, is to recreate a public health infrastructure um, within communities that allows for treatment of trauma, but also opportunities and pathways um, that are alternative to this subculture, um, alternative economies that people have come to depend on. That is not to say every person who is committing violence um, is deserving or wants a second chance. There are truly some folks who are, you know, who are doing bad things and there is an enforcement part of this that has to happen. But by far the majority, you know, there was a study in Chicago of young people in Chicago about why they carry guns. And, and a overwhelming majority of them responded to this survey and said for self-protection. Um, they are not going out there armed because of with an intention to cause harm, but it is for protection because we have failed to provide that level of safety in mostly black and brown communities um, in our cities. And so the way out is not oppression and further enforcement and incarceration. The way out is to create a um, set of violence reduction infrastructure and public health systems that will allow the community to heal and move forward as a community. And I think that's what Connie believes and that's, that's what I think I am trying to do um, in Chicago as well. Thank you. I'm dying for the, I know the, the actors are itching um, to talk to you. And I, I don't know how that happens that they pop up, but um, I hope they will. Hop in. So I, Oh, Esther, you go ahead. You go ahead, Esther. Okay. No. Me? Okay. Um, I would love to ask because we had the honor of speaking with one of the dramaturgs, Hector. Uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago. And something I didn't get to ask him that I would love to hear from, from you both is in the aftermath of, of the riots and um, and then y'all put this amazing show up where you were reflecting back to the LA community, what had happened through all these different lenses. I'm so curious what, because in the aftermath of a trauma, whether you've become numb to it or whether you're still quaking with it, um, it can be a lot how someone, when someone holds the mirror up to you, what was your experience or did you have an experience of how people felt receiving this work. Because I think about everything that's happened this year and in the years leading up to this year and that we're gonna be reflecting this back to everybody um, next year. I just wonder what was your experience like watching the community two years after um, the actual events, especially in relationship to this material? Was it open arms? Was it too painful? Was it, what did you see? Well, I, I thought there were a variety of reactions. There were often talkbacks after the show, so that was really instructive. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. usually dominated by white men <laughs> but, well, and their questions. Um, but, you know, I mean, communities of color came out just to see it. I think um, mostly supportive. Uh, there were, and I 
remember there were school, you know, people brought in students. And I think that there was a great appreciation of that too. I mean, things were still very raw only a year later. Mm -hmm. um, there were still burned out buildings and so-called commissions on healing and, you know, so on and so forth. So I think that the sentiments were still bristling in mm -hmm. LA, certainly we felt it in the rehearsal room. So and I think uh, Susan, the, the question could be also, sorry, during pertinent to you, because maybe Tiffany's question has to do with how do, and you're not an actor, but you're an activist and a, a government uh, person. How, how do we walk <clears throat> in the midst of trauma? How do we walk in the midst of trauma? And I don't know, Tiffany, if the question has to do at all with how do we protect ourselves or is protection even in it? Or how, how is the self, the real self, the human you in the midst of trauma? In your case, it's realer than maybe us in a dramaturgical session. I don't know, emotionally it's raw, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for you. I mean, I think every community um, generation deals with trauma in a different way. I know for the immigrant, Korean immigrant community um, in the aftermath of the civil unrest, um, there was a lot of anger and angst, but also the sense that they should not speak because um, they, they, uh, they appreciated the English speaking second generation leaders to go out there and speak, but they did not want to speak themselves. In fear, I think that they would be targeted again. Um, and I think for a couple of years after 92, I went to many, many towns, um, largely because Elaine could not be everywhere. And so she would ask me to go and speak in Michigan or you know, in other places. And I met lots of communities where um, the same thing happened, where white men would mostly talk, but there was a lot of anger also from African-American communities, like, what are you doing here? You know, get out of here because I don't wanna hear from you. And so I think trauma, all that tells me is that trauma <clears throat> sits there for a long time. It is not something that we can work through. And I remember seeing Twilight for the first time and thinking, this is kind of one of the ways in which we are going to come out of this because until we actually confront it and see it um, in front of us in some level of safe space, I think the reactions of the Korean community or the anger of the African American community, all that is only self process and not processed in the community. So I do think that collective healing is, is one of the um, great things that, that Twilight offered. But one little tidbit, how do you take care of yourself? I meditate, um, but I re recognize that this past year, you know, as the deputy mayor, you get a notification for every shooting, um, every crisis that happens in the city 24 hours a day. And I realize that um, now that I don't have that feed past two weeks, I've not had the feed, I can hear myself thinking better. Um, so I know that my brain was, um, to some degree vicarious trauma was going on because I can see that I am, my husband says I laugh more <laughs> in the last two weeks. And so I do think there is definitely um, trauma that we all go through and um, it, it takes time to heal. Miss mm -hmm. Che, Esther, you wanna say something? Ask something. Yes, hi, I, I, I wanted to first say thank you so much, Doreen and Susan, and of course, Anna, for the work, the hard and harsh work that we, I don't feel, I, I don't know if I could step up to that level. I'm just even already feeling very anxious thinking about the, our, our project, to be honest. But that's, it's, aside from that, my, my burning question actually is, and it's, it's a simple question, but it's not a simple answer, I would imagine. What do we do now? Not, the we isn't the artists or the actors or people connected to the play only. Like, what do we U.S. citizens do now to bring down structural racism? It feels very big, the violence. And so I, I love to hear the perspective of Susan when you're on the ground, what you think as citizens, like whatever steps we can take. And also Doreen, your perspective 
as a historian as well to put it in perspective because of course it feels so big for us now 2020 and yet it has happened before obviously twilight uh, shows that and a lot of the other historical moments um, that we've gone through so I, I would love um, some guidance in regards to that well I, I don't know that there's any one thing that anyone can do but certainly um, we have the wrong leader in White House um, who is not helping us to get over structural right. racism. Elect him and get him so out. So obviously we need to vote and do something different um, in DC. I, I think action matters. And I think in, in this age of an information driven society, sometimes we think that, um, you know, participating in that information um, domain is the only way for us to participate. And I think there are lots of different ways in which people can help to um, act um, for the right things and to alleviate inequity. Um, you know, and it really depends on what your passion might be. Your passion is in theater, mine is in um, community empowerment and advocacy. And so we all do our part, but I think we have to think about every day, how are we contributing to um, reverse the history of inequity in this country and what are we doing to make a just society? Well, I mean, I just want to put a little pin in this idea that information matters, but, and it reminds me of Anita Hill telling me that people were walking up to her after that horrific <laughs> uh, experience um, and saying, I watched the whole thing. And Doreen, as you know, I wish to disrupt the passive audience. Right. You know, if this, we are in this culture of just like uh, consuming, and by the way, the, the media is just pushing it at us. When I think about that murder of George Floyd, to me, it looks like a lynching. And yeah. other people have said that. And mm -hmm. of course, those big lynching spectacles were spectacles where people pass out postcards, you know, postcards. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was speaking with uh, Paula Giddings, the biographer, the wonderful biographer of Ida Mae Wells. And we were sort of talking that, well, in a way, these uh, videos that we send around are kind of like those postcards. And we could say, well, we're sharing information. And the media playing them over and over again is kind of like those postcards. And, and so to me, it's like, well, CNN, you're giving me information, but you're also selling cars. Right. So if you had just no ads, I could get it. Otherwise, you're selling lynching postcards. Doreen? Right. Absolutely. So I agree with Susan, we need to um, act and to intervene in our various worlds um, and to do more. I'm so glad that you brought that up about spectatorship, Anna, because I think that that's really crucial, that it requires more than being a passive audience. I've talked about the notion of reparative creativity in the arts. And I think that that's actually what artists are up to in the face of trauma to take this and to do the hard work of addressing structural inequality in the industries we inhabit and to use the power of the arts to move people intellectually, politically, emotionally, even kinesthetically, if you want, um, you know, to do something. So all of these domains, I think, are part of it. I think if we like, I mean, basically we have to dismantle racial capitalism, but that's not gonna be, do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, that's not gonna happen in one fell swoop. So there are all these levels at which action can occur. I wanted to give a shout out actually to Elizabeth Alexander, who was one of our other dramaturgs who's president of the Mellon Foundation. It's like, okay, if you have the resources of the Mellon Foundation, this is what it looks like to do progressive work. It's like giving money to like 50 black theaters. It's like money for like redoing monuments so that it's not a Confederate monument, it's Breonna Taylor, do you know? So it's like using all of those resources at every level, it matters. I think, I think philanthropy is changing, you know, yes. I think, you know, uh, right now, I think Lorraine Powell Jobs is an example yes. of yes. a very innovative uh, philanthropist, wouldn't you say yes. so? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, Emerson Collective is doing things in very different ways than I would say traditional philanthropy is. And even in Chicago, one of the reasons why I decided to come to Chicago was actually a coalition of 
50 plus funders got together to jump in before the city would jump in on the violence crisis. And that's almost unheard of in, in the philanthropy world. And so, you know, I do believe philanthropy is changing, maybe not fast enough, but certainly um, moving in the right direction. Wonderful actors. Anybody have a, a, a burning question to, to take us out? Any more, any questions at all? Carl, do you? I do. I, I, I would love to. Um, I just think that, um, oh, how do I put this? I think about when I first saw this play uh, after, after the events in LA, and I think of where I have gone as a person since that time. I, it's kind of a two-part question. I, I would ask for the three of, of you. Um, it, in what way do you think as citizens, um, our response is different now to these sorts of events as they were to the events in LA at that time? And in what way is our response as citizens like the same? Like in what, what would you say is our biggest pitfall that maybe we're not, we haven't changed? Am I being clear? That's a fantastic question. Thank you. Ladies. <laughs> that's a tough question. I mean, I, I see a lot of the same in the sense that um, after 92, as earth shattering as those events felt, um, you know, energy waned and we kind of went back to the way things were. It did build up to things like LAPD consent decree and reform over time. It, it did lead to, you know, um, better recognition of what use of force, the use of video policy, like things did change, but did the world change in a, in a more equitable way, in a equally earth shattering way, I would say no, which is why we had the murder of George Floyd and you know, we had the Ferguson and you know, Freddie Gray in Baltimore and, and all of that, right? So to me, it feels frustrating because I don't think the world has changed as much. The thing I did see change this year um, was the multiracial, multi-generational way in which people responded. Um, I think the challenge now is, will that energy sustain and will we build a movement or will we go back to being passive observers of history unfold? Um, I hope it's not the latter. But, and I hope this um, wonderful multiracial, multigenerational alliance that was built through protests will morph into a actionable um, movement, but I don't, I don't think we have seen that yet. So, you know, I would say more has stayed staying than, than has changed, unfortunately. Doreen, take us out, oh. wrap this up. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Drop the Kirji and wrap this up for us. Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree with Susan, basically. I mean, if we look back to like the LA rebellion in 65, right? This Kerner Commission, same thing, you know, poverty, systemic inequality. So, yes, multi generational. I think it's really wonderful. Um, but to capitalize on that and to really, you know, do the hard work as you did, Anna, I think that's the challenge and very few, few are going to have the, you know, fortitude or the willingness. Resources. Gordon Davidson kept saying yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I had mm -hmm. five dramaturgs or something. Do you know what I mean? Right. Kept yes. So resources are also very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. So at every level, that has to happen. Um, and I hope that we can capitalize on that, those multiracial coalitions and not let, we haven't talked about Asian Americans as model minorities that can be used as weapons against black and brown, you know. So um, that's another thing to think about to not let, you know, those of us who are Asian American not to let ourselves be used in that particular way. Um, and to realize that our position of relative privilege, like within the racial hierarchy, even though we're not white, so. 
Well, I, I'm sorry to have cut you off like that. Um, I thought that thought was at the end of a sentence. You know, I don't really listen to sentences as though, as you know, Doreen, I have to just guess about breath when someone's finished, but um, I don't see a period at the end. So um, just thank you both so much. What an exciting way to end my SIG space events with this rich, rich, rich conversation. Uh, you've both said things, some things that just like slip right by, <laughs> like could be a whole book. So I wanna thank you so very much. And I wanna thank the actors for, for being with us. It just makes me feel so much less lonely to have you in this with me. Okay, thank you and- Thank you. Mwah.